we have the privilege to be with Nick Morgan, top communicator, speaker, and coach, you know, um, from all of America. Uh, Nick, thank you so much from, from Boston. Thank you so much to be with us. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Nick. Thank Nick. And, you know, we didn't, like we were talking, we're trying to go to, to, to the question quickly for our audience. What do you, how do you feel? Are you, what do you think about empathy is used to generate reciprocity in this, uh, in this in online market, you know, like today that uh, mm. communication is changing and, you know, on your bestseller, obviously the last book, you know, can you hear me? You know, mm. we, we see how communication is changing. What do you, what is your, what do you take it from, you know, empathy with reciprocity? Uh, reciprocity is one of the most powerful human instincts. So if I do something nice for you, you feel morally obligated and, and deeply obligated to do something nice back. Uh, that's the way reciprocity works, very simple. Uh, and the issue is if it gets inauthentic, if it gets too uh, mechanical, uh, and if it feels like you're doing some little thing nice for me just to force me to respond, then I'm going to resent that over the, the long run. And so it doesn't work as well in the virtual world, but it's such a powerful human uh, response that it still uh, does work, even if it isn't as perfect um, as it should be, as authentic as it should be. So what I say to people is, uh, and I love the word empathy here, is, if you're going to uh, use reciprocity, then do it in a way which considers the response of the other person in advance. That is, don't do something for somebody that is either very difficult for them to respond to or unpleasant or risky. Um, and online, remember, everything feels riskier than it does in person where we can get visual cues that reassure us and make us feel safe. Um, so. You, you need to use reciprocity with care, in, in, especially in the virtual world. Do you think online, do you think online everything is look more risky? Yes, absolutely. There's no question because we humans are wired to, uh, to ask ourselves the question, is this other person a friend or a foe? Um, and when we meet face to face, we instantly get visual signals hopefully that they're going to be a friend <laughs> and not a foe. Um, but we instantly get signals that tell us uh, what we're dealing with. And those are the kinds of signals we're used to evaluating very quickly and that we feel very confident about that. Online, we get virtually none of those signals. So we have no way of, of evaluating whether this person is friend or foe. And so we tend to have a negativity bias. Right. And that is we assume the worst because that's the safest thing to do. So if I'm prepared for danger, then I'm more likely to be ready for it. Uh, and, and so the, the online world feels more risky. It feels more dangerous. And it is. Uh, but it's mostly because we don't get the feedback that we're so used to getting in the face-to-face -face world. Uh -huh. do, do you... Do you see, you know, as an expert in, in, in communication and this, do you see that um, it's going to get uh, more and more like an online virtual meeting? It's going to be, you know, uh, so common that we will be able to, to feel better, to be, you know, to lower our defense on that? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, the, the, the more nuanced answer is, of course, the more you use a technology, the more comfortable you get with it. But um, these issues of the lack of feedback run very deep. They're mostly unconscious issues with us. They're unconscious feelings and, and anxiety. And so what happens is, even though we think we're getting feedback um, and it, we think we're understanding things correctly, we're not, and that creates a nagging anxiety. So for example, if you ask people about how well their email communications work, 90% will say um, that they understand other people's emails accurately. And in fact, their accuracy rate is only 50%. So there's a huge gap there of what we think we know and what we actually read correctly. 
we're much more likely to read an email, for example, again, uh, that, a, uh, that a communication is sarcastic or hostile in tone when that's not intended. So we have that tend tendency to go negative. And as a result, there are lots of, uh, lots of communication misunderstandings in email and in, and in the business world in general, even over the phone, even in video. My favorite example of this, which I love to ask audiences, is when I'm speaking live to people is, so have you ever sent that email to one of your colleagues, especially if you're a manager and you have people that report to you, yeah. uh, to some of your employees, um, the following email, nice job, two words, or a great job, or fine job, just two words. And everybody always raises their hand. Everybody sent that email. Yeah. Well and I say, would it shock you to learn that 60% of the time, that email is interpreted as sarcastic. Oh, wow. And there's an audible gasp in the audience when I, when I tell them that. And they'll say, how could people be so stupid? Because they immediately blame the other person. Right. <laughs> they never blame themselves. And, and they don't realize that nice job can be read sarcastically. And in the virtual world, with our negativity bias, if it can be read sarcastically, it probably will be read sarcastically. Uh, and so uh, then they, once they realize that, the audiences always say, so what do I do about that? And, and I'll say, use emojis, um, put in a friendly smiley face, because then they can't uh, misread it. And, uh, and then we have a whole discussion about emojis. Some people don't like them. They think they're childish. They think they're for millennials, on and on and on. It's a whole discussion. But, um, but I'm a big fan of emojis because they reduce that, that emotional ambiguity. And, yeah, right. and they re reduce the likelihood that you'll uh, interpret something negatively. Uh -huh. Yes, and, and it helped. Like, you're absolutely right. The help on the, on the advertising and this, it helped a lot when you will use the emojis. You know? But nonetheless, um, you just have to face the fact that if you're communicating in the virtual world, you're going to be misunderstood and, and you're going to misunderstand. And so we need a lot more care and attention to our communications in the virtual world. But the problem is that the virtual world made communicating much, much easier. So it used to be if I, before email, I'd have to type something out put it in an envelope, inter-office envelope, and send it to my work colleague, or put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and send it to a friend, a letter to a friend. There's a lot of work involved there. And so I took time with that, and, and I was more careful, and I sent fewer of them. Now, with uh, the virtual world, we, we get hundreds, thousands, perhaps, of emails every day. I, I talked to one business person who says that he gets 10,000 text messages, Slack messages, and email messages every day. 10,000. 10, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's and so, Yeah, and so as you get more and more communication, that's the problem in the virtual world, as the level of just the sheer amount of communication goes up, what happens is we, we do triage. We, uh, we start skimming. We start uh, trying to eliminate as many as we can as quick as we can and so that leads to yet more misunderstanding because we're reading too quickly we're not taking the time to try to give the benefit of the doubt to the other person if we see hostile intent boy boy do we get mad and on and on so just the sheer amount the ease of virtual communications contributes to the problem yeah you're absolutely right you're absolutely right excellent point excellent excellent point do you uh, do you find that uh, reciprocity is um, is overused sometimes on the on the marketing? We using too much reciprocity to to generate a okay. Uh, I give you I give you this PDF if you give me the email. Yeah, how do you how do you see? I'm very curious for your your answer on this. Yes, it, if uh, people don't like to be asked for things, especially now we're more aware of the of what happens when I give somebody my email, not only do I get hundreds of emails from that organization, but then they sell it to some other organization and I get hundreds from them. So people are savvy to that. And we don't like to have our email pile added to, it, it's already out of control. So, uh, so if uh, I believe it's much, much better just to give away that 
that sort of thing. If you have a PDF on your website that you want to share with people, just share it with people. Don't demand their email in response unless, uh, unless it's part of a carefully graduated um, business where you're giving away some things for free and then some things of greater value you're charging amounts of money for, and then you need to get the email and the credit card details and all that. You know, that's, that's part of doing business online and everybody understands that, but that's value for value. But on the internet, we expect, everybody expects to get a certain amount of things for free. Yeah, that's correct. And, and so there should be no reciprocity there. That's right, yes, yeah. yeah. I have a question. You know, when you talk about storytelling, you know, um, mm. and on, on this, one of the second steps, you know, that you, you talk about, you know, talk about the problem for, for uh, the problem of the audience, the, the audience. Can you elaborate? Can you tell, tell us more about if, when we talk about the problem? Are we, we talking about the, the pain that the person, the audience, are we using pain to, to get the attention from the audience? How do you, how do you work with your, your, your customer on that? Yes, the, the, the way I like to explain it is to think of going into a doctor's office. If you go into a doctor's office and the doctor immediately shakes your hand and says, hello, sir, in my case, uh, uh, here's your pill, here's your remedy, here's your prescription, then my reaction is going to be, wait a minute, I didn't tell you what was wrong with me. How do you know? You're obviously not a good doctor. So I'll be very suspicious. And so what I want that doctor to do is listen to my pain first. I want to be able to describe all the symptoms. I want to say, doctor, it hurts here and it hurts here and this is what's wrong and here's all my problems. And, and then I want the doctor to tell me something intelligent and provide me a solution. And so the doctor has to do two things. He has to show or she has to show that she understands my problem, first of all. And second then, and only then, can she give me appropriate medication or, or exercise or whatever it is that's going to fix me. So th the same way for a speaker and an audience, I have to show that audience that I understand what's on their mind, what their pains are, what their issues are, before I can start recommending uh, things to them. Yeah. Um, and so I have to, in my case, I have to persuade people that communications is hard before I can start saying, here are all the ways I think you should communicate. Is that right? And uh, but who, that's the, the idea. Hero? Who is the hero? Who is the main, the audience is the hero or we are the hero? You should always make the audience the hero if you can, mm -hmm. because you need to respect the journey that they're going on, the journey through their issues and their pains and their worries and questions. And, and then you can help them along toward a solution. And in that way, you're more like a mentor. You're not the hero of the story. You're the mentor in the story, the wise uncle or, or aunt. Or, or grandmother that, that has advice uh, to give because you've been there before. And at the right moment, then the hero might turn to you and ask for that advice. So that's the way to think of yourself uh, as, a, as a speaker or the communicator in that situation. But the audience should always be the hero, if at all possible. And how do you see, what is the chain? Before it used to be that uh, the companies or, 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 or we were the hero, and now we're talking more to to the audience. To, to we we build on them. Like it, you see, advertising the communication before it was very straightforward. You know, we are GE. We produce this, this, this and you know, you got to follow. How do you see that chain in, on on the on, on the communication today in 2020? Well, th that sort of marketing and advertising has gotten much more difficult because again, everybody's so overwhelmed with information. So, so how to cut through that noise? And one of the ways that we've responded is uh, that we've tried to get much more personal and authentic and real with marketing. And the risk there is if it comes across as too much as my individual story, if I put myself in the hero role, then the other, the audience won't necessarily be engaged with that. If I tell a very, very good story, maybe, maybe they will be, but um, the, the, the real key is, is, as we're saying, to make the audience the hero, not the company, and not, not me, the storyteller, but the, uh, the audience. And so I should go on their journey with them. Let's say GE used that example, selling cars, uh, traditionally, the way cars were sold were on features. This car has a bigger engine, or this car has better wheels, or this car has uh, more electronics, or whatever, whatever the latest gadget or thing was. Um, and now, it's a 
the better way to sell is to say, I understand what you need in the way of a car. I understand the journey you're going on. You need this sort of car. You live in a city, so you need a tiny little car that's very fuel efficient and it's easy to park in a little space, right? And so I've got that kind of car for you. Or maybe you live in a um, in the southwest of America and you've got long distances to, to travel, so you need a big, comfortable car that can drive very fast. Uh, um, so it's, it's about f fitting the the solution to the audience's problem. That working exactly, working on them, working on on, on what's the problem. You know, many marketers. You know, and many time in negotiation, we would definitely we talk to the problem. You know, and and that when um, that if I talk to your problem, that's what I capture your attention. No. Yes, exactly. That's the. That's the classic way to do it is uh, if you can show that you're sensitive or understand the audience's problem um, in any way, then that's a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you see that if I talk to your, to your problem, can I, can I be, uh, what would be the difference between I talk to your problem in a nice way, you know, and uh, persuading that I can help you and not be considered as a manipulating that thing? manipulating the, the fact that I know the problem because sometimes it's even confused uh, persuasion or manipulation. You know, mm -hmm. what do you, how do you see that line to be different? I think the trick is you have to show that you understand that audience's problem maybe even better than they do. So you really have to do your, your homework. You have to go deep, deep into it. And, and when you do that, when you tell the audience things that make them go, oh yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought of that, but that's, you're exactly right. Then that, that's when the lights really go on and, and things start to happen. Yeah, absolutely. No, excellent. Do you, do you have any um, example on it or the, uh, of, without saying name, huh? any of your, your, uh, the person that you coach that um, improved the way that he communicate through storytelling, you know, the, 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 anything that you can share. I'm very interested, you know, I want to share with our, uh, you know, how important it is today that uh, communication is complicated, you know, it's it getting complicated many, many times, especially when we, when we do it online. How, how can we be better? You know, why, why is more and more, more people want to have a coach, want to go fast, want to, so can you help us to, to, to talk, I'm very curious to, to, to learn from you. Sure, so I think of one example, a, a gentleman who called me up and he uh, had just been promoted to his dream job, the job he'd wanted all his career. He was, had just been promoted to senior vice president at this company where he had worked for many years. Uh, so a little bit unusual, most people move around quite a bit from job to job, yes. um, different companies, but he had stayed at one company uh, and He'd been promoted because he was cool in a crisis. So when things went crazy, he just kept his head down and did his work and, and, and he got promoted each, each time. Well, he's now the senior vice president. And when he called me up, he said, I've been in this job six months. I said, congratulations. And he said, I'm about to be fired. And I said, my goodness, why is that? I was really surprised. And he said, because they tell me, I'm at the senior vice president level, I have to be able to show my employees that I care about them, that I understand their problems. But I've been, I've been being cool in a crisis. I've been hiding my own feelings for 25 years. I have no idea how to do that. He said, can you help me? Can you help me show my employees that I care about them? So I said, sure. And I was thinking to myself, it's going to be difficult, <laughs> but... But uh, he, he came to visit me in, in, in Boston, where we have offices. And we have, like many businesses, we have a big conference room table, okay. one of those uh, long brown wooden tables with 12 chairs around them. Yeah. Um, and whenever I get somebody visiting and we meet in that room, they always sit in the same place. They sit in the middle of the conference room table with their back to the wall and their face to the door. Okay. And that's because they understand the, uh, that's a power seat. And, and they may have been coached, in fact, that that's a powerful seat, so that's the best place to sit. Or they may just do it instinctively. Uh, but this, this person 
went to the far end of the room and he sat down in the corner. It's extraordinary. Senior vice president of a big publicly traded company, thousands of employees, billions of dollars of revenue, and he's sitting in the corner. <laughs> and I had to go down to the end to sit with him. And his, he was sitting there, his shoulders were rounded, his head was down, he didn't make eye contact with me. Now, this is very strange behavior with somebody that you've just met, um, but it was particularly strange for an executive of a publicly traded company. You'd, you'd expect much more uh, engagement. So finally, after we chatted for a while, and I tried very hard by sort of bending over to try to get him yeah. to make eye contact, he wouldn't do it. So <laughs> I tried very hard and failed. And so finally, I said, excuse me, um, your behavior is very odd. It suggests that you wish to be invisible because you're hiding from me with your shoulders and your, right. eye, your eye contact, or lack of it. Um, and yet you say you, you want this job, this public senior vice president job. What's going on here? I just asked him the question. I said, this, you seem like somebody who you say you want this job, but you're acting as if you want to be invisible. So to my astonishment, he started crying. And he said, he said he was bullied. He finally was able to tell me he was bullied from age 12 to age 18. He'd grow, grown up in a very small town. And there was a boy who was about four years older than him who uh, was the bully of the town. And he particularly picked on, on this executive. And so he had shrunk in to himself to try to escape the bullying. And there was no escape. It was a small town, but he could minimize the bullying as much as possible by just hiding and, and curling up in, in himself. And he said, and this was the really powerful realization for him and for me, we always learn from our clients, but um, he said, I hadn't realized I was still carrying around that experience 35 years later. Wow. And so as we started working, the first thing I, I did, we set up meetings every two weeks to talk by phone or by video and, and I said, your first two weeks, you only have one thing to do. He said, what's that? And I said, you're going to pull your shoulders back and sit up straight, no more rounded shoulders. That's it. I don't want you to think about anything else. Just for two weeks, every meeting you're in, every important meeting, when you're at home and you're relaxing, sitting on the sofa, I don't care. You can do whatever you want there. But, but in the meetings during the day, sit up straight. He said, okay. And we'll check in in two weeks. So two weeks later, we get on the phone. I say, how are you doing? And he says to me, excuse the language. He says to me, you bastard. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I said, what? And he said, I'm in pain. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, because I'm using these muscles I haven't used for 35 years. I'm sitting up straight. My shoulders are sore. This hurts. And he started laughing. And he said, it's amazing. But people have been, had been coming up to him, especially the starting by the second week. People started to notice. And they've been coming up to him and saying things like, are you doing something different? Uh, did you get your hair cut? <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you change your clothes or something? And they couldn't figure out what was different, but they just sensed a difference. And that was the beginning of his transformation. And to his enormous credit, he, he saved his job and he learned how to, uh, to create much more uh, charisma and presence, executive presence, which he <laughs> needed it's, it's phenomenal. I, I, I know in, 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 in your book, uh, I think it's chapter number three, you mm -hmm. know, uh, what you explain or, or two is, is, is phenomenal. I've been, I'm not only myself, but I, I've been, I've been coaching and even my kids, you know, <laughs> just to, just to know, okay, you know, my kid the other day was in Starbucks. So I give my credit card. I said, okay, you ask, you know, and I said, okay, when you ask, you see that, uh, you know, just playing, no, like, uh, you know, just behind daddy, you know, and just give the credit card. I, I want you to ask, you know, we need to teach them to. No, no, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I've been doing this for 26 years. And I said, oh, my God, yeah, it's just, you absolutely right. The, 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 the body posture, it helped tremendously. You know, you don't even notice that uh, right. your, your body is, is talking, no? And that's, that's the first thing that people see is your posture. And remember that the sim simple, most basic, most fundamental question that people ask of other people is, what is your intent toward me? 
And if I'm meeting you for the first time, I want to know, are you going to be a friend or a foe? Um, but as soon as we get past that, assuming that you're some kind of friend, then we want to know, what is your intent toward me? What, how are we going to work together? How are we going to get to know each other? What is the intent here? And posture signals intent in ways in which we don't, we aren't consciously aware. Uh, because um, to use the example of my of my executive here, he was signaling that he wasn't happy to be in, in that room or any room right. uh, by his slumped right. shoulders and whatnot. And he just, he was completely unaware of it. It was just part of his history. And what I learned from him is that we are, we are always, we humans are always signaling two things at the same time. We're signaling on the one hand, the way we're feeling in the moment. Okay. And on the other hand, we're signaling our history how we feel about ourselves, the good things that have happened to us in life, the bad things that have happened to us in life. So we signal our, our body language history. And yet, when we meet somebody else, they don't care about that history. All they see is, is whatever you're, they take it as whatever you intend for me at the moment, what's in it for me. And so it's really important for people who, start to care about communications and body language to think, what is my own history? What am I signaling through my body that I've been carrying around for years? And that's really the first step is to become aware of your own signaling uh, through your posture and, and through everything else. We're just using posture as the example here, but it's beginning to take charge of that and become aware of it. Because um, as with the case of my executive, he was completely unaware that he was sending out two messages. And so he always looked like he was unhappy to be in that room. No wonder they were going to fire him. All right. I, and I, and I, I think it is so strong, uh, your example. Thank you, because it's so good. Like, uh, how, can we, how can we learn something so simple? It can help us tremendously. Because obviously, he's an extremely smart fellow, you know? Yeah, yeah. But... You know, it was lacking of that little thing. He says, oh, wow. There's a yeah, so once you point it out to him, then, then he's instantly aware of it. And, and then he can't escape the knowledge. You can't put that knowledge back in a box somewhere. So that's the powerful thing about that kind of coaching. But often yes. Um, yes. It, requires, it requires a coach or somebody who has a little distance because his colleagues couldn't tell him that. They knew it at some level. They knew that, let's, let's call him John, um, they knew that John always looked unhappy coming into the room, but they, they, couldn't, they couldn't say that to him because they were his colleagues, and, and th those things are hard and awkward to say, and, and so it, it takes somebody with a little distance. Uh, yep, yep, and it, the same thing with a, when we coach in negotiation many, many times, it's hard for, for the person uh, you know, to be coached by your boss or, you know, Very hard. and on negotiation, you, you want a, an upside person, you know, but I, I mean, it's, it's tremendous. What I, what I read out, I love it. And, and like I said, I, with my kids, it's so nice to see how, how we can, we can change because um, we don't only communicate by words. Exactly. No? It's, uh, it's, yes. it's, and do you, do you think that I can become a better person if I put effort and I become a better communicator, a person that it, I, I know how to persuade, to influence? What do you oh, think? no question. You can be uh, much more successful in, 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 in your business endeavors. But I think the most important thing is to find out at a very deep level um, what it is that you need to communicate or why what's your passion? What's your desire? How do you want to change the world for the better? When you can unlock those kind of things then and find out that and start communicating that, that's when your position and your, uh, your power in the world really explode and really uh, grow. What do you mean your passion? I was, uh, as, as you know, as we shared at, at the beginning before this, this call, I was, uh, when I was a teenager, I was tobogganing and, and crashed into a tree and fractured my skull and was in a coma. And during that coma, which lasted a week, I died for 15 minutes. And when I came back, uh, at first, I could no longer read body language. The, the ways in which when you see a friend or a colleague 
or a loved one, you can instantly tell if they're happy or they're sad because you know them, you know how they normally look. And so you can see if they're unusually happy or unusually sad. You, you just can tell that. You don't need to think hard about it. You just can kind of read it. I couldn't do that anymore. So my friends were a mystery to me. I didn't, I, I couldn't understand what they were talking about when they were joking or when they were being serious, when they were being sarcastic. Um, I couldn't tell whether they meant what they said. And when you're dealing with teenagers, as I was 17, uh, teenagers are are very often sarcastic. They're not, <laughs> that's the norm. So, uh, so I misunderstood them a lot. And in fact, one of the first things that tipped me off when I went back to school at age 17 was a friend said, Nick, you look great. And, and I had this big scar running down the side of my head from the from the accident and I was pale and I'd lost a lot of weight. I didn't look great, but I thought, Oh, he's telling me I look great. Thank you. That's nice. And, and he was so shocked by my response. He thought, what's the matter with you? He said, Nick, no, you don't look great. I was joking. I was kidding. I was being sarcastic. And that was the first time I realized that there was something very wrong. So uh, I started to train myself by staring at my friends very, very hard <laughs> uh, for a long period of studying them endlessly. Uh, and I gradually retrained myself to know how to read that very basic body language that every, virtually everybody else can read. And, and that process just made me aware in a conscious way of body language, which we humans normally experience unconsciously. Oh my God. So, I, so that I, I, really started my interest uh -huh. in communications and especially body language. And, and in body language, I'm telling you, this book is the easy book because I read a lot of, uh, you know, on, on body language. You make it easy for us to understand. And, and, and this, this is a, wow, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put it together. That I, that, so that's how your passion on, on, on communication starts. Yeah. You know? So that's what I mean by passion. You're, you're, for me, that's my life's work is to, understand that better and to help people understand that better. The first time I didn't talk about that accident for a very long time uh, because I was ashamed of it. Um, and we often, it's funny, we often are ashamed of th big things like that in our lives. Um, even though, you know, there was nothing particularly to be ashamed about. Sure. I was a little stupid. Maybe as a 17 year old, I shouldn't have gone down that hill so fast, especially in a toboggan, which you can't steer by the way, very well. Uh, so maybe that wasn't such a smart thing to do, but plenty of teenagers make dumb decisions. So there was not a lot to be ashamed of there. But it, was, it wasn't until many years later, in fact, till I wrote it in the book, that I thought I better start talking about it, better get comfortable with it and talk about it in a speech. Um, and so the first time I gave a speech about it was to a group of IBM executives uh, and engineers, very nice people, but very intellectual, very smart. And I wasn't sure how this story would, would go with them. And I told the story and there was a long silence when I was done. And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> they hate me. They hated the story. And so the long silence. And then finally the applause started and they applauded. And I thought, oh, okay, so maybe it wasn't so bad. But then what happened was this, uh, um, man who was very tall so i'm six foot but this this fellow was four or five inches taller than me he must have been six five or six something like that wow. very tall from the back of the room he jumped up and he had a huge head of gray hair and a huge bushy gray beard uh and that made him look even bigger and he came running toward me with his hands up like yeah. this and i thought oh my goodness this man is going to kill me he hates <laughs> he hated this story i was like what did i do yeah. <laughs> and instead he gave me this huge hug and he lifted me off the ground and when he set me down I could see there were tears streaming down his Aww. cheeks and he said my son is autistic and it has been the hardest struggle of my life to communicate with my son and he said you help me understand what it must be like to be autistic it must be like that because he understood that one of the not all autistic uh, kids but one of the ways in which it can manifest itself is through not being able to read those common uh, body language signals from other people. Yeah. And that's why we have, they have such a hard time understanding how, um, how people are reacting to them. So uh, he was just very grateful and uh, that was completely unexpected, uh, but uh, 
That's awesome. A wonderful That's, moment, yeah. I know. Thank you for sharing the story. It's awesome. But related to the story, how do you see, you know, the uh, vulnerability? Okay, uh, there is a chain. Do we, when we speak, when we talk to to people, do we need to be more open and be more vulnerable to to the audience, like it used to be before? Yes, a huge change, certainly in uh, in speaking. Um, in, but I would say the same is true for companies. They have to be more open. They have to admit to their mistakes and own them and, and, and so on. But uh, th that's been the single biggest change. I've been coaching people in public speaking for 22 years now. Um, and the single biggest change has been that it used to be you could stand up in front of an audience when I began behind a podium with a script and you could keep your head down, you could read that script um, and it could be full of facts and figures, but no, no vulnerability, no stories. Now, if you did that, people would leave before you got finished. It's just not acceptable that the, the norm has changed so much. And now we expect people to be vulnerable and open and tell us about themselves yeah, and, and be real in ways that uh, are, are completely uh, uh, a step forward, I think, from from the way it used to be. So absolutely. And by the way, that just makes for much more interesting speeches. Yeah, no, it, it, it made you, I don't know, it, it, it feel better. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know, it's just uh, just to be us, just to be able to to, to, to say, to connect, to, to you know, uh, like uh, sometimes people don't like my accent. It's okay, you know, just shut it down, you know, just <laughs> stop the video, you know? So, yeah, so right. how, how things are changing before it was kind of, a, oh my God, no, I, you know, you know, it's just that, and our customer is hey, you know, it's a, we use it on our advantage, you know, it's, it's someone, you know, we negotiate with the English, we negotiate with the American, we're, okay, you know, if someone doesn't, there, there, there's people that are very straightforward and very aggressive, and either they don't like it, you know, use it as your advantage, ah, you know, I speak your language. You know, if you're patient with me, this, you know, maybe yeah. I have to tell you in writing, and, you know, and we get other concession just because of that, no? Like, uh, we exactly. have to, I think it's so important. You know, we got to be real, you know? Um, I yeah. have one question that okay. if you, if you have three minutes, mm -hmm. you know, to three minutes to tell uh, uh, a, a person who you love the most, you know, an advice of life or, or something before, you die. Mm. What you were talking? No, not necessarily be three minutes, but you give what, what you would tell to that person. What is the advice to that we can, uh, you know, we can learn from Nick to all over our uh, our audience. You know, we, what would be? We each we each only get one life, and the the worst thing in the world would be to get to the end of that life and say, "I wish I had said something to somebody, a loved one, and failed to say it." And so uh, for me, the most important thing is just what you were saying, that openness, that willingness to share that authenticity. Why not? Life is short. Why not uh, uh, have that deep conversation now? Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't waste your time with chit chat and don't talk about the weather unless there's a hurricane coming and you really need to talk about the weather. But uh, don't waste time. Uh, get right to the, the real heart of what makes us human, uh, because that's all that matters in the end. Uh, we, we humans either connect with other humans while we're alive or we don't. And if we don't, then why were we here? Wow, that's great. Thank you. So just, mm. just, uh, just be confident that you can connect, you can communicate, connect. you can... Uh -huh. Nothing else is, is worth the effort, right? It just yeah. isn't. Yeah, at the end, you know. What, what is that? Just, just to, to, to finish, I know you're busy, but if, if, before we finish, um, your book are phenomenal, and, and I'm going to put it, I'm going to mention, I'm going to put it here uh, underneath, you know, the, 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 all, all your books. But Thank if you, if you have to re uh, recommend, or, or, or what are your favorite books that you will recommend to, to our, our, our audience? Sure. Um, so, first of all, the, the classic in the field of communications is a book by Robert Cialdini called Influence. And it, it, that should be on everybody's bookshelf. For any, anybody who's interested in communication should have Cialdini's uh, uh, book, Influence. It's just uh, a classic. It tells 
the five most important ways in which people are influenced and, and connect with each other, especially anybody in the marketing world, you've got to know right. that book. So, and I assume many of your listeners already do, but that's, that's a classic. That's a little classic. less well-known is a book called, I have it here, A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander and a bunch of his colleagues. So this is a group of, of architects and sociologists who were exploring how people sh experience space, um, whether it's in a city, um, the, the, the way the streets are laid out, or whether it's in, a, in an office space, the way the office is laid out. Um, the, we're, we are deeply and profoundly influenced by space, the spaces we find ourselves in, and that affects the way we communicate, the way we behave. Uh -huh. um, and th th this book w works out some of the ways in which people uh, communicate better and some of the ways in which they uh, don't communicate as well. Um, for example, a very, a very simple example they noticed in, uh, um, in cities. Uh, so the width of the sidewalk, as we call it, or pavement, as some people, uh, as the English call it, um, affects both how fast people walk and whether they're willing to stop. And as soon as you make the sidewalk uh, a certain width, uh -huh. then it will become a place where people gather. That's right. And it's, it's completely down to the width of, of that space. And you make it too narrow. And you, let's say you have a restaurant and you want to set up some chairs outside and, and, and be able to eat outside on, yeah. in nice weather. Um, uh, if, if that space is too narrow, nobody will eat at your restaurant because it doesn't feel right. But if, if you have enough space, then, then you'll attract a crowd. So it's uh, things like that. That's just a simple example. But um, that's, not, that's, that's brilliant. I, yeah. I'm, I feel, you know, like uh, in, in your books, you know, just using the example that you were saying, using my body to use, to, use, to cover my environment, you know, and around, it helped me to, to be a better communicator. I don't know. I Excellent. think it's just, it's just part of a... The who we are, the we we have to own ourselves, no? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then finally, um, anything. Last recommendation: anything by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh -huh, you a, like him? I like him. He's a great storyteller. I sometimes argue with uh, the the, the uh, examples and the theories he puts forward, but I don't always agree. But he's such a great storyteller. I'll read anything that he writes. I know it's a, it's a, it's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. But uh, Kenny, thank you so, so much for your time, for your dedication. Uh, I'm going to put a, a, a underneath even your website, how people can get in contact with you. Great. And I just, uh, you know, thank you, you know. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Thanks for uh, this conversation. It was a lot of fun. Very good. Thank you.